and then we'll get this meeting started for you. All right, so we're looking at the Commander software today. It's a Windows-based software product. My name is Steve, and I'm VP of Sales here at MAC Systems, so that dispenses with introductions. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our company first, just so you know a little bit about MIC and the Commander software. It's a Windows-based product uh, developed by MIC, and uh, MIC Systems is a software developer based in Southern California. So if you've ever flown out to Orange County, our offices are right next to the John Wayne Airport um, out in Orange County, California. And we have a building out here. And we've been in business, like I said, for 39 years. We're currently supporting around 3,000 uh, installs in 10 different countries. And so we're a pretty strong established company, still family owned. Um, Commander is basically a solution for every department. We have something for your parts department, your service department. And I just muted out your audio, guys, uh, Bruce, because there's a little bit of background noise and I want to keep the recording clean. So I will unmute in just a second uh, and pause for questions. But we have a solution for parts service. We have an accounting interface with uh, QuickBooks. There's a module for your sales department to sell whole goods, boat, motor, trailer. Uh, we have a purchase order module for purchasing parts. And so it's a complete solution for your business. And we're going to touch on each of those uh, areas as we go through the demo. Um, as a Windows-based system, we're going to be hosted on one computer. So there's going to be a central computer that acts as the host. And then all the other computers we call client computers. And those are basically just connecting to the main computer. Um, it doesn't have to be a full-blown Windows server. So you can run on a desktop as a server. We usually try to make sure that that computer would have a little bit more computing power so that we have a computer that at least can serve data to the workstations um, and run at a decent speed. So we can provide you with the computer specs if you want. Right now for uh, a server, if you're using a desktop, we're recommending an i7 processor, which is an Intel processor. Uh, we like solid state drives because they have no moving parts and they're exponentially faster than the old uh, hard drive technology. And um, as far as RAM goes, somewhere between 8 and 16 gigs of RAM is preferable. You don't need a whole lot of disk space, maybe 50 gigabytes and so forth, and you'd be all set to run Commander. Um, let me just pause for a second and make sure we have the computer count right with you guys. Vanessa, how many computers are you were looking at running on how many? Four. Four computers. And Bruce, how about you folks? Well, we're looking at two. Two, okay. Possibly on a th three because of the front end for the cash register. Okay. I'm wanting to know whether the, the our POS system, if it's compatible to where y'all can hook up to that as well, or if that's not. Well, Commander has its own point of sale system in it. <clears throat> okay. so, so we're going to be your point of sale system um, for selling product uh, across the, whether it's across the counter or, or at the front. Um, we have a tie-in with a thermal printer and a cash drawer, and let's just talk about some of those options here uh, for you. Uh, before we go there, let me just touch on on a, a really important subject that is going to be dear to everybody's hearts here, and that is uh, the subject of parts price files. And uh, parts price files are included with Commander at no additional cost. And this is a huge, huge savings when you look at buying Commander. Uh, we're going to provide you with a list of the parts price files that you see here. And they will be parts price files for each industry. So, Vanessa, for you as a marine dealer, uh, you'll be able to pick the price files that you want, whether it's Land and Sea or Mercury or, uh, you know, Evan Rude Johnson, Volvo, Penta, Honda, uh, and so forth. And, you know, any other distributors that you might do business with, we load those into the system for you so that all the parts and prices are already in the system and you don't have to worry about uh, inputting those. <clears throat> and I'll show you how that works in just a second. And then for you folks that are, uh, we're on the outdoor power equipment side. This is a big difference in terms of how our competitors are doing price books. So for you folks at A, B, and C, uh, parts price files are included with Commander at no additional cost, which, as you know, if you were paying for your price books, 
um, that adds up fairly quickly and, and of course can cost you quite a bit of money there if you were updating price files. So for example, on the outdoor power equipment side, it's not uncommon for people to have as many as 20 parts price files. And even if the updates only cost you $75 a piece, you would be spending $1,500 per quarter on price updates, which is $6,000 a year, just updating your parts prices. So these systems out there like C-Systems and Ideal and some of our competitors all charge for price books. And of course, with Commander, um, the price books are included. So an interesting subject here on the outdoor power equipment side, um, our, our biggest competitor, of course, was Ideal and they were acquired by Constellation Software back in 2011, and then they saw a significant increase. They also owned Inventrack and IDS, which was, which by the way, was PCS on the Marine side, Pulse and Computer Systems, a very, very good software product, but it was DOS-based. And um, so they've been swallowed up, and of course, their, their, their rates have gone through the roof. Uh, recently, C-Systems in July of 2018 was also acquired by Constellation. So the majority of our competition now, there are two major competitors in the outdoor power equipment space have both been acquired by Constellation because this revenue that they get from the price updates is very significant and uh, something that they were obviously interested in. They're a NASDAQ publicly traded company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, I looked up their stock prices just for fun, and I noticed that they'd had a massive decline in their stock price over the last six months, so maybe they're trying to bolster revenue. Uh, as soon as Constellation took over C-Systems, they raised the rates on their dealers but somewhere between 150 and 350%. I had a call from a dealer just last week who was paying $450 a month uh, for support, and their rates went up to 1200 and change. So um 12, and that's twelve hundred dollars per month so we're talking about a significant increase in the cost of uh support uh in commander you're going to pay a fixed low monthly amount for your renewal so you're not going to pay for individual price updates and uh, our renewal fees start as low as one hundred dollars per month and then of course it goes up depending on the number of computers so for vanessa you'd be looking at 140 a month for four computers and for you folks at A, B, and C, you'd be looking at 120 a month for two computers. And uh, just to get the pricing out of the way, in the it, right up front, guys, I'm not going to go through all three, of, all nine of these reasons. But um, one of the things we're going to look at today is our QuickBooks interface. Commander ties in with QuickBooks. This is a very, very popular feature uh, where all of your customers' invoices, payments, and bills will transfer across from Commander into QuickBooks, so you don't have uh, a lot of manual entry to do into your bookkeeping system. It's going to do this electronically for you. And we actually include the QuickBooks interface now with Commander at no additional cost. It used to be 475. So that's going to be uh, something you might want to take advantage of. And just to go straight to the uh, parts pricing model that we have, uh, the startup price for Commander, of course, is really affordable. We base it on the number of physical computers you have that need to run the software. So just to back that up for a second, uh, the one computer license is $2,400 and 100 a month. Uh, a, B, and C, you'd be at 2,900, 120 a month. And then any additional features you need, like data conversion, if we were doing data conversion, or if you needed um, an EPC interface with PartSmart or Midas or whatever, these different EPCs, we'll talk about these too. Um, those cost a little extra. Every computer that you add after the second computer is just $250 and an additional uh, an additional $10 per month. So three computers would be $31.50, $130 per month, and so forth. So it's, it's really, really affordable as far as uh, who we're competing with. Keep in mind that the prices that we're talking about include installation. So we set up, set up the software for you. It includes your training. And so we have training classes for you. And uh, just to go out, over the support in terms of how it's bundled. It includes your parts price updates, your technical support, and any software updates that we come out with. Uh, so as we add features to Commander, you're going to be able to get those features at no additional cost. So let's exit out of this particular presentation here that we have and switch back to the other one. And then we'll start showing you some additional features regarding that point of sale system. Bruce, that you guys were talking about. 
We use barcode scanners basically to scan items because all of the price books that we get can be scanned. Once you load a price book into Commander, we talked about those price files a minute ago. Um, we have an app that we're going to give you, which is a comes with Commander. It's a price file loader, and this is used to load price updates. So whenever there's a new price update for Mercury or Briggs or whoever we're loading, uh, we send you an email notice. We tell you that there's a new file available, and, and all you have to do here is is execute the download to get that file over to you. So let's say, for example, I was looking at loading a Mercury file. I just click on Mercury, and then this will ping our server, grab the new file, and bring it across to your computer. So all of your parts and prices are going to be updated in Commander automatically. Uh, let's go up here and just go to a uh, Briggs, Briggs file, just as an example. All of these yellow folders that you see on the left-hand side here are price books that I have loaded into the system. And some of them might be parts that I want to put in. I've had a guy ask me, can you sell fireworks? Can you sell fuel? Can you sell guns? I mean, we have people selling different things. But when the price books load, they load into these yellow folders that you see on the left-hand side here. So if you want to navigate from you know, a Briggs file to a different file, you're just going to click between the price books. Let's say I want to go to steel. I just clicked on steel and now I'm in steel's parts and prices. Or on the marine side, if I want to click on Mercury, I just click on that Mercury folder. Every single part number that Mercury has, uh, including descriptions and pricing and UPC codes, all resides within that folder. So it's really, really simple navigation. It's This is like a library of price books that you can just click on and switch between your price books. Now, what this means is that putting your inventory into the system is significantly quicker because we can take any part number, it doesn't matter what it is, uh, either scan it or type it in up here in the look for bar up here in the top left, and that part number comes right up in the system. And so now all we really have to do is add how many we have in stock. So we put in two, and we could put in a bin location if we wanted to, and we save the record. So just like that, we've put the item into stock. Now, one of the things we do is we use this, this scanner that I'm showing you here. This can also be used to take inventory and to put things into inventory. So as you're scanning items, you could put them into stock, uh, either by collecting a file to the actual scanner itself. This is something you can walk around the store with and just collect the data to the actual scanner uh, and then dump it in. Or you can just scan in real time as you're selling parts, so putting them on invoices in your point of sale system. So let me just pause for a second. Bruce, I'm, unmute, I'm unmuting you guys now for a second. I wanted to ask you, um, in your point of sale system, do you have scanners, barcode scanners now or not? Yes, we do. You do. OK, so those in all likelihood are going to work with Commander. You don't need to buy this scanner. Um, this scanner that we sell currently this, is this Honeywell 1902. And these go for around seven, $800 new. So we're selling refurbished ones here for $295. Um, and of course, you can get those directly yourself or get them from us. They sit in a charging dock. So they're similar to the old cordless phones, and then they're always ready to go when you pick them up. OK, as far as that there, that one there is, is going to be a mobile scanner? It, it's a wireless scanner. That's correct. Wireless, yes. The yes. one that we have is connected to the box itself. We couldn't. For some reason, they can never make the Honeywell work for it. Well, um, I, I think the one that you have now will work just fine. I'm sure it will. The, the wired scanners are fine. Um, I like the wireless. We would, we would want the wireless. That was one of the things we originally wanted, but I don't know. They had problems, and then we ended up with a laptop to be able to do it that has a scanner on them. Oh, plugged into it. Okay. And it does it, which is a, a hassle. Well, this is one of the reasons we went to this particular scanner. It's a really high-end scanner, and it works really, really well. So we, we um, certainly have plenty of these if you want to try them. Um, we have them in stock, and you, cer you certainly are welcome to give one of these a try if you want. If it didn't work out, you could always send it back. But we've had great success with this particular model. Um, so it, like I said, it is a high-end scanner. I think brand new, they go for close to 800 bucks. Yeah, that's what we they were called it. Yeah, so 295. I mean, that's a that's a good deal on a refurb. All right. So moving forward, we print barcode labels out of Commander, 
And so we have the ability to print these uh, UPC tags if you want to. Now, keep in mind, most of your product that comes from your suppliers already has a barcode on it. So I'm not going to need to print a label when I have a barcode already on a product. But let's say I wanted to print a barcode label. All I have to do in my items section of Commander here is right click on the part number, and then I can print a barcode label right from here. It asks me if I want to print just one label or I don't want to print the on-hand quantity, which in this case would be two. So I could be labeling a box, I could be labeling a shelf, I could be labeling every piece, that depends. And then putting the price on the product is optional. You don't have to put the price on the product like this, this you can turn off. Um, obviously, if prices are changing all the time, especially with electronic parts price updates, if you're labeling everything, everything with a price, uh, you end up having to relabel the items if the prices change. So that's up to you whether you feel like that's worthwhile or not. But we sell these barcode printers here. And these are the printers that we have that print the barcode labels right out of Commander. These labels will also print uh, when you're receiving product. We have a purchase order module. So when we're receiving a purchase order, uh, these these parts will, uh, these labels will print right from the purchase order and they'll have the customer's name on them and the invoice and so forth. So you know exactly who uh, those parts are being received for. Now we're going to go to point of sale. This is for Bruce and for Vanessa. When we sell parts out of Commander, we've got a choice. We can use a regular laser printer and print a regular receipt, or we can use this small footprint receipt that you see here. This is a star printer. And uh, the advantage to the star printer would be, of course, that you don't buy toner cartridge. Toner cartridge from HP is anywhere from 65 to $85 these days for a toner cartridge. Um, and here you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to get toner cartridge. So we're looking at um, thermal receipts and a small footprint printer like this. This ties together with a cash drawer. So obviously you can have a cash drawer pop open. And for Bruce, do you folks have a small footprint printer like this? What kind of printer are you guys using currently? We have a printer like that there. We also already have the cash drawer like this one. And the case, so you guys have the printer and the cash drawer. So those are going to work with Commander in all likelihood also. Well. Good. Well, I guess what we're missing really is the wireless scanner. Okay. Vanessa, what about you guys? What how are you doing your point of sale currently? Are you doing the small footprint printer or how are you doing that? Yes, that's what we have. Okay. So let's go and sell a part and let's see what that looks like in Commander. Let's take this uh, part number that we just added and uh, we'll take it to an invoice as if this was point of sale and we were selling it. Somebody came into the shop for the first time and uh, maybe we want to sell them this part. So all we're really doing is we, we pick up our scanner, we scan the item and it goes right onto the ticket. We go to the checkout window. We tell the customer that's $1.93. Let's say they're giving us $10. We add the payment. It makes the change of 807 and we print the invoice. So it, it's a very, very simple point of sale system. You can get people out the door really, really fast. Um, we've timed it. You can do an invoice or a receipt in somewhere around five to seven seconds and you'll be printing a parts receipt. Now, this is, of course, a plain paper receipt showing that you can put your logo at the top if you wanted to do a plain paper invoice. You don't have to buy pre-printed uh, form stock. We're going to print on you know, a laser printer if that was something you wanted to do. And then since both of you already have the thermal receipt printer, all you would be doing here is changing that and saying, well, I'm printing on a thermal receipt. So when that receipt prints, you would get the uh, grocery store little slip receipt that we were talking about here just a minute ago with the star printer or the Epson printer or whatever it is that you'd be using. So there we go. So very simple, all, code, all coded and ready to go. One question, while we're on the receipts, do y'all offer any type of a receipt that would print that would also give us say, a tear tag that would be able to tag onto the person's equipment or no? This is done in the service module, which we're going to next. This is actually the parts module for selling parts across the counter. So usually when you're just doing a straight parts sale like that, you're just selling the item across the counter, almost like you're a grocery store or whatever. We, let's go to service and address your question. We'll just go straight there, I think, just to kind of keep the demo moving. 
You're gonna notice I have I have a repair order uh, icon right here, and that's where I just clicked. And when I click on the repair order icon, this is where I get the customer name, the date that the work order was started, the serial number of the equipment, the year, the make, the model, all that kind of stuff is listed here in this grid. And in here, we can also tell the status of the job. We can create a tag if we want to, a service tag. Um, and I'll pause for a second because specifically in the outdoor power equipment industry, um, you know, you have a lot of small engine stuff coming in. So it's it's a popular thing to be able to to log the equipment in and then give it a tag number, and then right mouse click and print a barcoded service tag. And this does the, uses the same printer that we were showing you here just a minute ago for the uh, for the parts at least for these parts receipts but it would have the equipment information on it. So you could tag uh, the equipment or tag a jacket or a tag and put it on the actual equipment itself. Um, and I have you guys muted for just a second, Bruce, just because of the background noise, I'll unmute you in, in just a moment. So let's, let's assume that we're looking at this grid and we wanted to look up the service history on a particular piece of equipment. All we would have to do is either type in the customer's name or type in the serial number of the equipment and we would get a complete listing of all the work orders or all the jobs ever done on that piece of equipment. So in this case, I'm just typing in a portion of a serial number, and that's going to give me all the work orders that I've ever done on this one particular Honda mower that I have in my system here. Um, I can go back and look at those service tickets, open them up and see the work that was done. Um, so we're storing service history for as long as you have Commander. There's no uh, limit to the length of time. It's not one year or two years. It's just for as long as you've had the system. You're going to have the service history on every piece of equipment that you work on. The work orders or repair orders, as we call them, all have a status, and this is important. Uh, the status over here lets me know, has this job been completed? Is it just an estimate, like a quote? Or is this one that's posted? Posted down here means it's an open job that I'm currently working on now. And there's an easy way to filter out the information. I can just go up here and say, well, just show me all my open work orders. I don't want to see the others right now. These are just the jobs I'm working on at the moment. Or just show me the ones that I've completed, in which case it filters out all the ones that I'm working on currently. So it's an easy way with Windows and the grid the way it exists here to filter out what you're looking at. But let's say we were looking at everything and we wanted to start a new job now and uh, get a work order started for a uh, scenario where somebody was dropping off a piece of equipment for service. So we right mouse click, we go new, and that opens up the new work order. We would either add our customer for the first time. So if they'd never been in our shop before, we have a place where we can put the customer's name, address, city, state, zip, phone number, email, and so forth. Um, or obviously, if it's a customer that's already in your system, you just do a quick search, type in a portion of their last name, type in their phone number, whatever the case might be and we can go ahead and get a customer selected to the work order. And I'm gonna use a marine related customer now for Vanessa just to show her that process. So as soon as I choose this customer, Craig Wilson, and I come across to the right here to see what Craig owns, I can click and I can see, and I'm gonna unmute Bruce for you guys here for just a second too, so we can chat about this. This little box that you see here is this customer's, what I would call toy box. This is all the equipment that this one customer actually owns. So they've got a boat, easy go golf cart, they've got um, a Grady White as a boat here. So if you have customers that have uh, multiple pieces of, pieces of equipment or fleet customers, you know, that own a number of different pieces of equipment, you'd be able to see them all listed here. All of this equipment here belongs to this one customer. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So I simply select the one that I want to do work on here, and that's going to put the equipment over here. The you know whatever it is we're working on is is then loaded to the right hand side of the grid. Um, if it was some, if it was somebody that had never been in our shop before, we'd never ever worked on this equipment before. We pop open a window like this, and in this window we can enter all of the information that we need to collect now. If, if it's marine-related product, just to be clear about this, if it's marine-related product, we would have marine-related fields over here. All these fields will relate to, you know, boat length and name and things like that that are related to the marine industry. 
But if this was not a Marine customer, so if A, B, and C buys Commander, they're not going to see engine one, two, three, boat name, hours, things like this. These fields are all labeled differently. So just to kind of give you an idea of how easy that is, because we're selling our software to different industries, we have preferences for the field labels. And all you have to do is go into the system and change your preferences for your inventory. And instead of being a marine dealer, you'd say, I'm an OPE dealer. And then it changes all the field labels to something else. So when you're looking at your unit inventory, as we call it, well, whole goods inventory, now you see all the field labels have all changed. They no longer say what they said before. And you can also label them something else. If you want to call them whatever you want to call them, you have that option too. So the software is incredibly flexible as with regards to uh, being able to be utilized in different industries. And that's how we're able to sell it to a number of different uh, vertical markets. So as we're looking at that at that unit data, notice how the fields now, Vanessa, you can see they've all changed. So depending on the depending on the industry, that's how we would determine the field labels. Um, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, now I see the tab for notes. Yes. And like we currently have it, uh, an area for notes and what we use it for is like so many of our customers, we have to go to their dock um, and pick their boat up and everything. So we use that for direction Okay. Uh, for the customer. So is that where we would put that in? Um, and because we like for that to print out on the um, tech copy work order. Okay. So it's a great question for Marine. Um, we we have a location field here uh -huh. to let you know where the boat is that's different to the customer's address. So that's actually part of that's actually part of the boat record itself. If the boat is actually in a dock or slip someplace, um, this location field down here at the bottom, and I'll draw your attention to it, is a place that it, it's a piece of information that resides with the boat record itself. Now, if you okay. if if you want additional information, and we and we did for our marine customers, we put that information on the front of the work order, and it also prints on the work order. However, um, to talk about the notes, let's let's chat about that for just a second because we got the customer in here, we got their equipment in here. Um, our outdoor power equipment uh, folks often uh, create a tag. There's where you can put the tag number. And then you can right click and do that uh, barcoded service tag to tag the, the small engine uh, equipment that comes in. But up here in the top left hand corner, you've got a green tab. This is service request. This is free form notes where you type in whatever the customer needs done. So this might be, you know, new impeller if it was a, a marine customer. And uh, it might be, you know, sharpen blades and to use something generic you know will not start right so it could be something just like that these are technicians notes usually related to what the customer thinks they need uh, maybe they don't know what they need but but it, it could be notes that print this is also a place into which you could put specific instructions about where uh the customer might be where it might be located um you know the gate code one, two, three, four, and then you know, put in the address if you wanted if you wanted to for the location. If if it was additional information that you think would would be needed there to have print on the work order, um, what what that does for you when you print out the initial work order, because we we would want to at some point, if you folks want to collect a signature, and we're exper experimenting with digital signature capture, we haven't gone there yet. But typically, what you would do is you would print um a copy of the work order like this and then the notes for the technician would be everything you typed in would be down here at the bottom service request and location see that down here uh -huh. so he knows where he's going if that was something you wanted to have print on the work order you could do that right there um otherwise we do have other work orders that print the location anyway up here you can see the location printed here And that would be a dock number or a slip number. You know, a lot of times it's it's in your own slips or racks or whatever when you're working on it. But this is where we would have a customizable disclaimer for you folks. And so down here at the bottom where you see the service disclaimer, 
This disclaimer is customizable, so you can change the text to suit your industry. Um, the customer would in turn sign it on drop off and um, that way you've collected it if that's something you're in the habit of doing. If not, um, we've got the work order started and we have the job logged into our system. So if we look at the, our top grid here, right here at the top, we're going to be able to see there's the job right there that we just logged into the shop. Now, the next step in the process, of course, is going to be to put the parts and labor onto, uh, this, onto this work order as the technician discovers what needs to be done. Uh, and, and that would be the next step in the process. Now, we do have for that mobile dispatching, let me just mention one other thing for Vanessa. There's a work order that we can print here, Vanessa. Um, this is a great one to send the technician with, and it's it has a place for them to put their additional detail on. So this is a pretty popular one to print here. Let me just give you a different look. There's a lot of different forms and formats. So this would be... Oh, yeah. Right, so this is just something because they're going remotely. So you print out something that tells them what needs to be done and then they're going to bring it back with the parts and labor and the time allocations and so forth for everything that they did for the service writer to actually then put the work order together. Nice. Okay. All right, let's assume now that we wanted to put parts on here and let's go to unmute Bruce and see if we have any questions. Bruce, I'm, I'm unmuting you guys. Do you guys have any questions for me at this point? Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me show you what happens next. All right, next we have to go out to uh, find parts and part numbers to put them into Commander. Now. As an outdoor power equipment dealer, a lot of the OPE dealers like this feature. You can just click on your web link here, and this could launch something like Parts Tree, for example, right? And I don't know if you guys use Parts Tree to grab part numbers, but this is one of the popular places for outdoor power equipment. Um, the, other, the other popular place to go for outdoor power equipment dealers would be to use something like PartSmart. Uh, or or a, a, a dealer website or dealer version of this. So we actually have integration with all of the different PCs that are out there. And I'll show you how this works. And Vanessa, I'll show you to folks also. You are, Vanessa, are you with Mercury or Mercury or who are you with? Yes, Mercury. Okay. So bear with me for just a moment as I show you this, and then I'll show you the Mercury uh, version of this. But Mercury, yeah, no worries. yeah, Mercury has their own. They've got their, um, yeah, you know, they've got Midas and they've got Easy Parts Five. But PartSmart and actually PartSmart lost their contract with Mercury recently, so they, this is not really. Uh, but they all work basically the same way. So when you're working and you're looking for a part number and you drill down on a piece of equipment like this because you're looking for something, this brings you to the part numbers. And Commander is actually integrated with the EPCs so that if you were looking for, um, let's say you were looking for this main jet here and you were to double click on the jet, um, it actually launches the interface with Commander and it's going to let you know um, whether or not you have the part in stock. So apparently I've done it. I'm double clicking and it doesn't like it. Let's see. Now, as soon as you have the part numbers, uh, it launches a it, it will launch a little box on the left hand side here telling you what bin it's in and what stock and what price you should sell it at. So this little box that pops open if you're using PartSmart Bruce, then you guys would have this data porting in. Uh, you can create a pick list, right click, add the part to a pick list. And then you get this little shopping cart, if you wish, right here of parts that you might want to add to a job. And so without cutting and pasting the part numbers over individually, there's a submit button down here at the bottom. And you simply click that button. And uh, that sends that pick list over so that if I now go back into my commander repair order, I hit the import button top dead center. And those parts go right into my work order. See how that works? That's kind of a nice feature. Very nice. Bruce, are you guys using PartSmart at all or not? No, we're not. Okay. 
So on the marine side, then just real quickly for Vanessa, because she's a uh, Mercury dealer, you folks have the old one, which is Midas, and then the newer one, which is Easy Parts 5. And the same functionality exists, uh, you know, with, which, whichever one you're using, it doesn't really matter. Um, we, can pull, we can pull parts and uh, we're tied in with Mercury the same way to be able to pull the parts across from the, from the cataloging system. Bruce, are you guys using Parts Tree then or how are you doing it? Yeah, we use Parts Tree. Okay. We use uh, just, just different entities, any, uh, parts houses. Different parts houses, okay. Okay. So, you know, having, having said that, the concept here is going to be very similar. You're going to have a pick list that gets created. I picked one that didn't have a, an image available, but you see this whole pick list of parts down here, Vanessa, that you see below the red line. Um, you would just go file, export, DMS, and then you pop right back into the work order again, uh, tap the import button, and in go the parts. I mean, it's really quite amazing the way that thing works between the EPCs. If it's a superseded item, let me just pause and show you this. This line that I clicked on here has a number next to a number. So whenever there's a superseded part, you're going to see a number next to a number and a red button lights up at the bottom. And if you click on that, it shows you the entire supersession chain. So it's letting you know whether you stock that item under a previous number. So that's a real handy feature too. We do a forward and backward supersession search. I'm just gonna remove this item. So this is how we build our estimate, guys. Um, for A, B, and C, let me just mention this. For you folks, if you're using parts tree, it's not going to be difficult. All you're going to do is you're going to click on the web link here of Commander. And you'll have parts tree on your screen. Let me just have that load for you. Um, you'd go into Kawasaki engine, for example, I'm working on a blower, you know, pick the model, cooling equipment. And then of course you have your part numbers here with your images. And all you're going to do is take the part number because commander has all these parts already in it. So all you're going to do is just copy that part number, drop back into your work order and just pop that part number right in there. And because the price file is already loaded, you don't have to worry about it it's going to go ahead and grab the item and there you go. Um, the part number is right on the ticket for you. So it's, it's just a matter of pulling the part numbers over like that one at a time. Um, you can move them up, group them together and so forth. So that's how we would do that. Does that make sense? The price file is already loaded. I didn't have to put in the description. I didn't have to look up the price. That was already in there. All right, so now we're gonna do labor. We can put labor onto the work orders by just typing in the word labor, or there's a labor menu that you can pull labor from. Um, so if you want to get labor in here, you can put your jobs in here and all your labor codes in here and you just grab them, uh, whatever those might be, rigging, haul out, sublet labor, welding, whatever it is that you guys do. So let's say, for example, that this labor line belonged with this top job up here. And we're going to put another labor line on here for the marine stuff. And you know, it is possible that you could have a marine work order and a uh, power sports, uh, at least a marine one and an OPE one, because it could be a generator you were working on, right? So boats have generators on them. Okay, so I'm grouping things together. What I'm doing here is I'm basically saying, okay, this labor line here, uh, these parts belong, and this is how we can task things. And so just track with me for a moment. Instead of giving this customer one big bill, and this is gonna be an expensive job, and instead of just hitting them with one big total, they might wanna know how much it cost for, the, for me to do the valve throttle and the float and carburetor. How much was that job? So I can ask the system to task it, and that basically is going to give me a total. And uh, maybe this job over here, let's move this labor line up. I love the way we can move things around too, which is really nice. But maybe this labor line here and these parts are part of another job. So we right click and we assign it. This is a great feature, Vanessa, for Marine too, because you have a lot of things. A lot of times you find three, four, five things wrong with a boat. And instead of just giving the guy one price, even when you're doing estimates, 
you can group them together like this so that they get a total for each job that you're basically doing and as opposed to just one big total. So I just created three tasks in this work order that we have to do. One, two, and three. You can see the, the tasks right here. One, two, and three. There they are. Now, we don't have all the parts we need for this job. So if you look in this column over here, this fill column, there's a lot of zeros. When there's zeros in here, that means I don't have the parts. I'm going to have to order them. So as soon as we know that the customer has given us the approval for the job, the system is going to go ahead and mark those as special order parts. And if you look in the right-hand column of the screen, you're going to see the letters SO. Those mean those parts have to be special ordered. So all those SO parts are parts I have to order in order to do this job. These parts are sent to an ordering pad for me, so I don't forget to order them. And if I look at my ordering pad, I'm going to see uh, a bunch of parts show up here on this ordering pad. So there's the parts that I have to order. There's some additional parts I have to order. We've done this all on the same uh, work order, but you can see the customer's name and the repair order number and so forth. So if we're creating a purchase order in Commander, right mouse click, create a new purchase order. Uh, we'll be able to see all of the, we'll be able to see all of the parts that need to be ordered. Here they are on our ordering pad. And we can simply take the Mercury parts, for example, if we wanted to and put them on an order. And so just drag and drop. I don't have to type. Look at that. I don't have any typing to do. I just choose Mercury as my supplier. And I create a purchase order. And I've got a purchase order now created for Mercury parts. So there's my Mercury purchase order. Then I want to create another new purchase order for those Kawasaki engine parts. That's all that's left. Let's go ahead and grab those parts, put those on an order. And I'd be getting those from whoever I get my Kawasaki parts from. Let's say World of Power Sports or Kawasaki or whatever. So just like that, I'm creating... I'm creating purchase orders very, very quickly. Notice I have um, two purchase orders here that I just created. Now, Vanessa, when we when we submit orders, and also for you folks, Bruce, when we submit orders to suppliers, we have an, ex an export button up here at the top. And this export button allows us to send purchase orders to different suppliers without typing them into the shopping cart. So in this particular case, this one happens to be a Mercury order. So we would want to push it out in the MercNet format. So we have a lot of these different integrations written. And that's going to take care of pushing the file so that MercNet will upload that into the shopping cart. So when you go into the Mercury shopping cart, Vanessa, you won't be typing these part numbers into their shopping cart. It'll They'll upload electronically into Mercury's ordering system. The same thing for... Uh, and let's go ahead and receive them now as if they came in. We can receive the purchase order, enter the bill, print barcode labels. There's all kinds of things we can do when we're receiving an order. But now we just received that order. And then for these Kawasaki parts, let's say that we wanted to export that order. Um, and Bruce, I forget who you guys are a dealer. Are you a dealer for any of these lines that we're talking about, like Steel or Briggs? or Who are you guys a dealer for? Brick, Echo, Moriyama, okay. MGE, Husqvarna. Okay. So a lot of these formats that we have here will work for pushing for pushing the purchase order, and then you can receive the order when it comes in. Now we re we've received we've received all the parts into the system, and there's a list you can print to. You know, a lot of times you have 10, 15 jobs on the go and you have to figure out where the parts have got to go. So we've got a list here that you can run. And when you run this list, it lets you know whose parts have come in and where, and where they've got to go. So in this case, all of these parts we received belong to this one job. Uh, but if we had other parts that we had received, now let's say we run it year to date, because a lot of times when you're ordering product, you're ordering for a lot of different jobs that you have on the go, right? So. It could look a little bit more like this, where you have different customers, different jobs, and the system's basically letting you know, okay, these parts go with this job, these parts go with this job, these parts go with this job. It's giving you a nice breakdown of where everything has to go. Okay, so back on our service ticket here, because the parts have arrived, we can actually now get the job going. Now, as soon as we give the parts to the technician, uh, the work order updates like this. All the parts go to the job. 
and we can get this job started. Now, maybe we need one hour of labor here. Maybe we need two hours of labor here. I'm just gonna change the time values. And maybe we need three hours of labor here. One, two, and three for the three different jobs. Labor lines that start with an L. You're gonna notice all the labor lines on the left-hand side all start with an L for labor. And that's left-hand column here. Those can be assigned. There's three things we do with labor. One of them is we can assign them to a technician. So we can assign the tech that's doing the job. We have a time clock where they can clock in and out of the job. And we have a scheduler where we can schedule that job to a calendar so we can track our workflow. So let's say this first job we were scheduling for technician and his name was Peter and we schedule him. Uh, we put his name on the job and we need him for one hour. So we go ahead and we schedule that. So now we have him scheduled for that first job. Um, if the same technician is doing the second job, you can schedule them all at once. It doesn't matter. Uh, but let's say we have a different technician doing this job. We have Dave doing this one. We need Dave for two hours. So we schedule him. And maybe this final line here. We have a third technician just to kind of demonstrate the point. Steve's going to do the last job. We need him for three hours, and so we schedule him. Now, if we look at the, if we look at the calendar to see what just happened, let's go back to our technician calendar. And don't worry too much about where I'm clicking or whatever. We, we teach you all of this when we do your training. You'll see the technicians, the three technicians sitting side by side. You can actually give each of them a different color. I've got Steve and Dave kind of similar in terms of their shadings, but each technician on the calendar is blocked out for a certain time value. And uh, Peter could walk in and say, well, what do you have me working on today? And you say, oh, let's have a look. Okay, we've got you working on uh, this work order here. And we can filter out everybody else's jobs. We can reschedule them if we want to. So this is a nice way that you can see what your techs are working on. And it's, it, that calendar gets written to directly from the work order system. Um, the time clock is just so that they can keep track of their actual hours, how long are they actually spent on the job. So if they want to do that and keep track of actual time, because the billable time might be three hours that we estimated for this job, but the technician might want to go ahead and use the time clock and then go ahead and clock in so that the clock is running and then they go to lunch, they clock out, come back in, clock out, clock in, clock out. And then that way when they're done, they have an actual time value here that is gonna be written to. Um, we can compute an efficiency rating in Commander on our reports, taking the actual time value and comparing it with the uh, billable hours. Now, obviously if I could bill out three hours and my tech only took one hour to do the job, I'd be, uh, I'd be making serious money in the shop. But uh, if it was the other way around and he took four hours and I could only bill for three, now I'm at 75% efficiency, three over four gives you a 75% efficiency rating, which also dilutes your labor rate because if you are a hundred $100 an hour shop, essentially you're running at $75 per hour because of technician efficiency. So that's something you do want to consider keeping track of. And I'll pause for questions on that. Any questions on what we've done so far? Everybody okay? Bruce, you guys okay? Yes, sir. All right, let's collect our money. So we're gonna to go to the checkout window here. And this is where we collect payment. And we can see we're owed $2,800. Um, there is a feature where the customer's balance displays from QuickBooks. And so for some reason, this customer has a $52,000 credit balance um, could be a check I've received from a bank for a boat or something else that I'm doing in the system. But it's or, assumably there'd be a zero balance or a red number up there if they owed you money. So Vanessa, if you guys are carrying receivables, you'll be able to see in red up there at the top if they owed you any money uh, on open account. So $2,800 is what I'm owed now. I can take a credit card payment if I want to. I can take cash. I can put it on their account if I want to put it on open account. Um, but let's say, for example, they paid with a credit card, there's a visa, pay in full, and we'll go ahead and print the actual work order, the final ticket. So this is what prints the customer's final bill. And I've got the wrong form type selected. So let me go ahead and just fix that. A 
lot of different form templates here. They all print something slightly different. So you'd have to look at those and uh, determine which one you think will work best for you. Uh, but here's the work order that we just printed. So it would print front and back in terms of being two-sided. And here's our front page. Let's just take a quick look at it. So you have the logo printing here at the top. It's barcoded, so you can recall it with a scanner. And then, as you can see, I've broken the work order down into three separate sections, and that's because I used my tasking feature. Do you see, so can you see how that's all grouped together? Yes. Each job has a different total for parts and labor. So instead of just hitting them with that big bill, well, they, they're going to see the big bill total, that, of course, on the, on the uh, summary page here. But it's grouped, it's grouped it together so they can see how much each job was. Uh, it also collected shop fees for us. You can see that right here. And so the system is designed to collect shop fees as a percentage on labor if you want it to, or you can put in a flat dollar amount. It doesn't really matter. Um, but that's how we close out the work order in Commander. And we print our final bill. Now, the work order, num work order number, if you look carefully here, the work our work order number here is 1324. So just kind of remember that. And this is the customer, Craig Wilson, 1324. With our QuickBooks integration piece, if we open up QuickBooks, for example, If we open up QuickBooks, uh, the QuickBooks integration piece, which we'll launch here in a second, let me just close it and then we'll relaunch it here. I've had it open since yesterday. This is the feature that transfers the data from Commander across to QuickBooks if you want to do that. You simply open up QuickBooks, hit the transfer button, and it's going to grab everything that just happened on the Commander side and put it across on the QuickBooks side for us, update customer balances, bring the money across and so forth. So if we go back into our customer center here, and this is on the QuickBooks side, and we go looking for customer Wilson, we're going to see repair order, here it is here, RO324. That's the exact same document number that it had in Commander, except it has an RO in front of it that lets us know it was a repair order. If it was a parts invoice, it would say INV like this. So we know which department it came from, and there's the money that came with it. And of course, we can click into the repair order and we can actually see the detail. That entire work order with its detail has been uh, created on the, on the QuickBooks side with the part numbers and everything all listed here for you. You can see the part numbers and descriptions uh, in QuickBooks, so you can actually see uh, and have an accountant's copy of that work order. We don't just do journal posting. We actually send the entire ticket across so you have an accountant's copy, and then you have the copy in Commander too. So any questions on, on that piece? Can you show what it looks like for the cash and credit card breakdown for the deposit? Sure. The breakdown is in two different places. And I don't know, Bruce, if you guys could hear that question. Vanessa was asking to see the breakdown of the cash and the uh, on the deposit side. When you, when you go into your banking, now, usually when you go to make your bank deposits, I literally, I, I changed mine fairly recently uh, so that we have uh, the money going directly to the bank account. Somebody wanted to do that, so I changed mine. Usually your money, when it comes across into QuickBooks, goes into undeposited funds, Vanessa. That's the, uh -huh. that's the most common way of doing it. And then you would have your cash listed here and you would have, um, so you could make cash deposits and then you would have your, your credit card uh, items coming across too. For the breakdown, we just changed this too. So it's sending over the credit card type. Uh, for the breakdown in Commander, there's also reports that you can run uh, to see what money you've collected. And we run a payment report here based on your cash drawer or based on whatever money you collected. Um, and that's going to give you a breakdown too. So this is on the commander side. And so this is going to be a summary of 
uh, cash you've collected, credit card business, and the breakdown of your credit card business is over here. Visa and MasterCard broke down. So this gives you a way to reconcile your cash drawer at the end of the day or reconcile money that you've collected. Um, if you wanted to see all of the money collected in credit card or whatever, you can drill down on it and say, well, I just want to see all my merchant services money. I want to look at all of my uh, money that I collected through you know, credit cards, for example. And you could run that in also. Now, we have... Integrated merchant processing. So let's, since we're talking about credit card processing here for a second, let's just advance these slides. We've looked at the cash drawer and the work order. Uh, we looked at the integration with the EPCs porting into the work order, which is uh, something we touched on here with Midas and Easy Parts 5, Parts Smart, and so forth. I just showed you the QuickBooks interface, which, by the way, is no longer 475. We're including that with Commander. So I put that additional I love free stuff thing there um this is the merchant services slide now this is the merchant company that we use with commander it's done through an x charge client piece and it's owned by global merchant uh, services uh, global is an endpoint for merchant business so they've got you know really good rates if you want to price shop them give them a copy of your statement or whatever um, there's a phone number you can call down here at the bottom uh, we don't merchant services rates here at MIC, we let them do that. Um, they'll they'll want to see a copy of your statement, and then they will uh, they'll give you a rate quote. Usually, they'll try to undercut it. Of course, um, I do have a video also that if you want to see what the merchant processing looks like in real time, um, I posted a video on YouTube, and I'll point your attention to that video. And all you have to do to find that particular video is go to zero seven commander. EMS, and you'll see a credit card integration video here. And of course, that video, if we were to run it, we'll see how it runs here for a second. In this video, I'll demonstrate the integrated credit card processing available in Commander using OpenAI machine and the X-Charge client. Let's create a new invoice select an existing customer. Using the quick scan option, it will scan a card onto the invoice and go directly checkout window. Next, select X-Charge credit card payment option. Pay in full and invoice. This will launch the X-Charge client with the amount due and customer address information already displayed. Ask your customer to swipe the card or insert the card into the chip reader. Within seconds, you'll have an approval code and the invoice will print. We just sold a part to a customer and processed their credit card in 40 seconds. So there you go. I don't know if you could, could you guys hear that? Yeah, for the most part. Uh, well, you can watch it some other time if you want to, but there you go. It was just selling a part in real time and just showing the, the, how the uh, merchant integration works when it's set up with Commander, which some folks like to see. So that, that concludes kind of the service part of uh, Commander as far as the uh, work order section goes, adding labor and so forth. And um, Bruce, do you have any questions on the service side? It's a pretty clean module. Yeah, I'd like to ask one question before we move on. Yes, sir. Make sure I understood it right. On that tear off tag that we would be able to, to put on our customers' units, yes. that is the barcode off the barcode label machine, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, I just wanted to clear, make sure of that. Yeah, when you right click here and you print that barcoded service tag, it actually puts the rep the customer's name and the serial number of the unit and all the unit information. That's fine, because on one of the problems we have is in the in this industry, so many of the serial numbers, they're not on the units. They use a stick on tag and they wash right off. That's it's, so we have to label it by either the customer or by a service number to where we can keep up with it. Exactly. That's one of the big problems we have. So when you're when you're in the actual work order itself and you're getting this work order started, um, you can type in. It doesn't even really matter if you have existing tags. I know that some folks have those, you know, tags that they already have numbers on them. I can go into the this little spot up here in the top right corner, and I can put the tag number in there. I can say, oh yeah, okay, this piece of equipment is getting tag. Uh, 
you know, A1234, for example, right? So I just put the tag information right there. And then if, and then if I come out, look at it, it has the tag information right here, right? So I've, I've cross-labeled it. And then, of course, if I right mouse click and print the barcoded service tag, that's going to have the tag number on it too. So, yeah, that was that was a feature specifically introduced for the outdoor power equipment market was this tagging of units. Um, yeah, that was our number one problem. Yeah, I haven't been able to do. We're still using the written forms for that reason. We're handwriting everything up, and we're using bridges. Ah. form that has the tear off tags on the bottom one goes to the unit one to the customer yeah so you no, you issue you'll love that you'll love that feature that's a great feature for you guys uh, you know that's what i've been after yep so that'll save you some money because you won't have to buy those anymore you're just going to use that same barcode printer that prints the parts labels okay all righty all right, let's drop down real quickly here to keep this moving. You're going to see a little blue and red key over here on the left-hand side. And this is where uh, what the outdoor power equipment industry calls whole goods or boat motor trailer. You know, it's serialized inventory basically that goes in here. So when we, we have our parts inventory module and then we have our serialized inventory here. Now, when we click into this section, what we're going to see here is we're going to see uh, yellow folders again, and these yellow folders are for you to decide. We don't decide what go what these are called or what they're going to be. Um, so for some folks will use them for the the manufacturer, you know, to separate Honda. I've got one called Marine, where boat motor trailer each have a folder. Some of them will have customer units. Some of them will be floored units or consignment units or rental units. Uh, you can even use it in a storage scenario where you have a storage folder like this. And then underneath that, you might have a handful of marinas. So I've got a north, south, and west marina. And in each marina, I might have docks, dry lots, uh, racks, and, and so forth. So it lends itself toward a variety of different applications, this design, uh, where you can create these folders just by right mouse clicking, create a folder, and call it whatever you want, put whatever equipment you want in it. So for you folks in uh, outdoor power equipment, you could have mowers and blowers and different things all separated. It's a really nice way to keep the, uh, the inventory. So if I clicked on my BRP folder, then I'm gonna see BRP product. Now, in addition to customer units that go in here, uh, we also keep track of what are called stocked units. Stocked units, of course, are the ones that you own and have available for sale. And you're gonna see a stocked flag right here there's no customer name associated with these units. And if I don't want to see all my customer units, I just want to see stocked. I've got these flags up here, or these little buttons up here on the top right. So I could say, well, I just want to see stocked units. I don't want to see all the customer units. So I just click that. And now it filters out everything except stocked units. These ones have a customer name on them because uh, they're on hold for a customer that might have given us a deposit or whatever the case might be, that the sale might not be concluded. But any stocked unit just displays like this. And when we talk about stocked units, there's a couple of features we like to talk about for just a moment. Um, we'll go to the back screen of the unit here. That's the detail tab. And this is where you see your costing information. So you'll have a base cost. Uh, there's a feature for internal repair orders. This is a great feature for everybody. This little field right here, Commander lets you create a service ticket or a work order. And that work order writes information right into that internal RO field. So basically what you have is the ability to uh, rig a boat, for example, if you wanted to put you know, uh, rigging on it and you had an additional dollar value going into a unit, or maybe it's a trade-in unit. A customer trades in a unit, you've got to fix it, repair it for service, uh, for resale. Uh, you could do a work order, fix it. It could be a rental unit that comes back in and you want to keep track of how much money is going into that unit um, over time. So what that field is actually doing is it's it's keeping track of that for us. So we'll find a work order here in just a second, maybe that has an internal repair order. Let's just go down the list. Maybe we'll discover one as we go here. Let's go to all units, take a look. And we'll scroll up here for just a second, maybe find one. There's one here. Okay, 
So we're looking at this particular unit had a base cost of 45,000 and there's internal of 1269. So you see it adds the 45 and the 1269 to give me this number of 46,269. Down at the bottom of the screen, there's an internal RO tab. And this is where it keeps track of all the internal work orders that were done. So if I click there, I can see there's actually three work orders, one, two, and three that were done that accumulate uh, that $1,269. That's what they add up to. And I can drill down on those and say, well, 708, what did we do here? And I click on that line and it opens up that internal work order. So this was the actual service ticket that was completed on that unit. And you can see it was just marked as internal. So as long as I mark the work order with a sale type of internal, it knows that that's something that I'm not going to receive money for. Not yet, maybe when the customer buys it. But I do want to keep track of the back end costing. I don't want to lose track of the fact that I have parts and labor or rigging or other things that I put into that unit. Um, it, that's a huge profit leak in a lot of businesses where their service guys might just grab stuff off the shelf and fix things and not keep track of what goes into the unit. So uh, Commander has a feature that we designed to specifically keep track of that particular process. So any questions on that? No. Inter internal work order? Okay. Now, when we move towards selling product in Commander, uh, we can take any stock unit, it doesn't really matter, uh, any unit that we stock, and we can take that serial number for the boat, motor, motor, trailer, whatever the case might be, we can move that onto an invoice. Our invoicing module is actually designed not only as a point module, but it's a sales module. It's sales and point of sale. So we can sell uh, entire units on one of these invoices if we wanted to. So let's, in this case, I've got a Mercury outboard motor that I'm selling here that I've invoiced out. Now, let me find one that has a little bit more detail on it. Well, here, let's talk about this one first. A very simple sale. This would include your business, Bruce. All you have to do is go in here, put in the serial number. It'll list out the equipment. Uh, put the customer's name on here. Go to the checkout window. Uh, receive your payment and invoice it. And this is going to print your ticket. Let me make sure I have the right ticket selected. And all these tickets could be pre-selected. So you're directing different stations to different printers and printing different form styles. You don't have to switch it every time like this. Uh, point of sale will print on one and so forth. So in a very, in a very simple scenario of just selling a piece of equipment or a, or a motor, you would have a serial number and you'd have the year make model. And you can see in the body of the ticket here, it's not just a single line. It actually gives you the year, the make, the model, and so forth. Everything's printing on the ticket. And that would be a simple sale of uh, a mower, a blower, you know, a motor, whatever the case would be. When we get into something that might be a little bit more complex, so we might be selling something where we have a little bit more on the go with a particular sale. Let me look up a customer's name here. You can create a sales invoice that has a lot of things going on. So you could have a unit that you're selling. You could have uh, manufacturer rebates. You can have boat, motor, motor, trailer. You can sell multiple units. Uh, there's a feature to add every kind of fee imaginable. So everything from DMV fees to registration and title fees, uh, anything that your business might do fee related that you are selling along with that unit. Um, in the, on the marine side, you could have a setup fee for rigging the boat. Uh, you can add a trade-in unit if you want to. You could have a trade payoff. Um, all kinds of things go into this deal. And then uh, you can create the invoice like this. Um, Vanessa, I don't know. Are you guys selling new boat motor motor trailer or not so much? Yeah. So for you folks, I do have an additional module available. Um, that you can click into by clicking the sales calculator here. And if you click on the sales calculator, um, I can show the rest of it, but I think I would prefer to direct you to a video um, just so that Bruce and them, because I don't think this pertains to Bruce. So what I want you to do is just write this down. And if you type in, if you type in commander sales module, 
you're going to see a video come up that says Commander DMS Sales Module and FNI Sales Calculator and so forth. And this video here um, that I posted in September, well, it's seven minutes long, and that's going to demonstrate the that's going to demonstrate the sales module, the FNI calculator, and so forth. So you can get a look at that. Okay. Okay. Outside of that, Bruce, um, you guys, let me just uh, mute you for a second here because we've got a little feedback coming in. You would conclude this sale by just going to the checkout window, collecting your payment, uh, collecting the money, whether it was a deposit or full payment, and then you would invoice the deal out. Now, as soon as you do that, in Commander, we go back to the units section. It's going to automatically take care of moving the stocked flag across to sold, and it's going to collect the customer's name right here. So it would be basically a sold unit that you would be looking at. So let's just look at our sold units. So you would see something like this. You would see, oh, we sold this unit. Okay, it says it's no longer stocked, it's sold. We can see the customer's name right here. And the invoicing of that unit does that for us. We don't have to come in here and enter it or whatever. We can also go onto the back screen. We can see the date that it's sold. Um, we would be able to see everything we need to see on this unit, uh, including if this customer walked into my service department just a minute later, I would be able to start a work order for Mr. Paul Wilson, right mouse click, new, uh, look for him by name, search for him. And we've got a Craig and a Paul. We go to Paul this time and we select his name. We take a look at what he owns and we look at all of his units. <clears throat> and we're going to see the unit that we sold him right here. We can actually see that unit and add it. So it takes care of updating the customer's profile with, with the equipment that he purchased uh, so that it's all updating in real time. The moment you sell it, it's added to his customer profile. The records are updated and so forth. Um, from a reporting standpoint, I just want to touch on some of the reports in Commander because sometimes folks think, oh, well, we just integrate with QuickBooks so we don't have any reports available in Commander. Um, it's, an impor it's important that you guys note that we have reports for uh, everything right down through General Ledger. From an accounting standpoint, Commander has its own chart of accounts. So we're actually able to run our numbers by GL. And let's say we wanted to see how much money we'd made so far this year. We did a year-to-date report by general ledger account number. And we looked at our account profitability summary. This is going to give us uh, by GL account, the different categories that we were tracking. So these are my general ledger account numbers here on the left. So you can see your different breakdowns for part sales, how many Honda parts I sold, how many Yamaha, how many BRP, how many Polaris, you know, how many Mercury parts I sold versus land and sea and so forth. Then we have our unit sales. Um, we would be able to keep track of uh, whole goods this way in different categories, labor or service income, all broken down for us. Uh, we're going to have a cost of goods sold. We're going to have a sale amount. And then we're going to have our profit dollars showing us how much money our, our shop has made over that time period. So this would be a profitability snapshot if you just wanted to see it by general ledger account number. Um, we also do a sales tax report for you in Commander. We do a technician recap report. This is going to give you a I look at each technician, calculate their efficiency rating, do a comparison between the billable and actual hours if they're using the time clock. It's a handy report. Your unit transactions, how many whole goods you sold, how much money you're making over a period of time, gross profit margins on all of your boat, motor, trailer, or your whole goods that you were selling. Um, the inventory valuation in Commander, this is a great report, inventory cost report. You want to see what the value of your inventory is. Everything that has an on-hand quantity greater than zero. So we've got at least one or more. And we go ahead and we view that. And that's going to give us uh, our inventory asset value, extended cost, if you want to call it that. So every category that we have inventory in, I've got a category called ARB. I've got 108 pieces of ARB inventory. So 108, an extended cost value of $17,000. Um, this report is actually 251 pages, and it generated in a matter of seconds. And so I can go to my final page if I choose to. I'll see that my Yamaha inventory is 35000 I've got a total of $995,000, almost a million dollars in this data set. So 
just seeing at any time the value of your inventory is really simple. You just run your inventory cost report and you have it right on the screen. So these reports are all available on the commander side. Um, the other thing that we do with the QuickBooks interface that I did not show you, which I'd like to show you very quickly, is the purchase order module. When we received that product from, let's say, Mercury, you can right click here and you can enter the bill. And this is so that the commander purchase order module and the commander bill pay module, I'm sorry, the QuickBooks bill pay module are tied together. So if we're looking at a vendor invoice of let's say 776655, that's our document number and we're, we're looking to pay this bill, we can put the vendor invoice and vendor due date here. Um, we can take a look at the product that was received and say, well, okay, this is all the product that came in on my purchase order. But I also want to make sure that I was billed correctly because I don't want to pay for something that I didn't get. So if something was cross shipped, we wouldn't be paying for it. And of course, if this was the correct invoice and we were paying for these products, we'd go ahead and verify that the purchase order and the bill actually line up. This is an auditing process of making sure that we don't just pay a purchase order. We want to make sure that the purchase order and the bill match. So if we're okay paying this amount and maybe we paid $50 in freight to get something sent a little bit faster, and we were paying a bill of $948.04. We simply add this bill uh, to the purchase order on the commander side. And uh, the next time we run our transfer to QuickBooks, if we were running our transfer, it would actually send that bill across into the QuickBooks bill pay module for us, or QuickBooks payables module. So if we go across to QuickBooks and take a look, we don't have to enter the bill here into QuickBooks. We can go straight here to pay the bill because it's already been entered. So all we're going to do is go into the bill pay section and we'll find that bill already teed up for us sitting right here at the bottom. And we can go right to that bill and you'll see that bill already teed up and ready for payment. There's the freight for, for 50 bucks. And so it's, it's sending the purchase order. This is the purchase order we're paying, PO1554. Um, and all that information is teed up for us to either cut a check or to pay the bill, of course, and offset it against the credit card that maybe they've already taken the money out of. But this gives you a way to reconcile your your bills and your purchase orders uh, and, and keep your uh, payables moving because payables and receivables are handled in QuickBooks, not in Commander. Um, your final P&L will be on the QuickBooks side because QuickBooks has a complete record of all your expenses, uh, given the fact that you'd be paying your mortgage or your rent or your payroll out of QuickBooks and not out of Commander. So we're just adding to or sending across all of the, the, the additional information needed as far as parts income, service income, labor, cost of goods sold, all that is coming across from Commander into QuickBooks uh, for you. So that's how that's all done. And uh, we'll pause for questions on that. Anybody got questions on what I just showed you? No. All right, let's wrap up the demo. We talked about merchant processing. This subject here of data conversion or data conversion is if you're switching systems and you're coming off a different dealer management system. So Vanessa, I don't remember. What, what are you folks currently using? Uh, total control. So total control will do a data conversion. We know how to get into their system and pull the customer list, pull the inventory, uh, get that out of there for you. Um, there's a cost, cost to do that of $250. Um, Bruce, how about you folks? What are you guys currently using? Anybody there on? Uh, the yeah. Yeah. We don't really have a full system in, that we're using like that. All right. So you won't be doing a data conversion. So we'll move on. Uh, we've talked about our pricing already in the previous slides. So I'm just going to move. Pricing, I do have a question in. Yes, sir. For example, a lot of times we order parts in from different places and we don't quite have the margin in them, but also for freight wise and what? When you guys update all of our pricing, are we able to say that our system would add a 15% to all, to all items? Yeah, let's go back to that. I did miss showing you two little features on the items section and I want to touch back on those for you. I think these are, it's an important question in terms of price points and how we calculate things and how we make sure you're making money. So I'm in the item, I'm back in the item screen and I'll draw your attention to the fact that we have a cost price on the item. That's what we pay for it. 
we have a list price, which is what they suggest you sell it for, and then we have a sale price, which is going to be what you actually sell it for. In addition to that sale price, we have nine other price points that you can calculate. So the system's designed to allow you to change your sale price and also to create nine other price points. And you do that simply by right-clicking on the category of parts that you want to uh, adjust the pricing on. And we have a series of formulas that can go into the actual system. Uh, you enter these formulas into the system to tell it what you want it to do. And you say, well, I want my sale price to be equal to, let's say, the list price times 1.3. That would add a 30% bump to your sell price. Or maybe you want to calculate cost plus a percentage so you know you're always making a set profit over your cost. Um, whatever the case might be, all these price points can be calculated with formulas, and we can even put in conditions. Sometimes the conditions would be things like, well, if the part falls between zero and ten dollars, you know, I want to do this to it. Or some folks will do anything under a dollar ninety-nine. You know, round everything up to a dollar ninety-nine. I don't want to sell anything for eighty-five cents. It's a dollar ninety-nine. Um, 99 cent rounding, nickel rounding, quarter rounding. I mean, we can do so much with pricing and manip right. manipulate your prices. Uh, then what happens is every time you load a new price book into the system and we do one of those price updates, it runs it through those formulas and it automatically computes your price points for you based on the adjustments that just took place. Um, if you want to protect your pricing, you can. You don't have to update the pricing. We even give you the controls of Thing, well, don't update my price on this item, you know, keep it the way I have it set because I buy oil in bulk and I break my oil and I don't want to have my per quart price be adjusted because I'm making extra money because I'm buying it in bulk and selling it by the quart. Um, the other thing I, did, I didn't show you that I just want to touch on is the reordering for stock. And that's on the detail tab at the bottom here of the item screen. And this is where we can set up ordering rules. Uh, Things like min-maxes. So if you fall below a certain level, my part falls below two, I want to order back to six. So you can put in a min-max, for example, and that's going to give you the ability to uh, not have to worry about a part when it gets low on stock. The system's going to be triggered. You run a stock order, and Commander is going to uh, pick up the fact that you have a part that's below its stocking minimum and that's going to put it on the ordering pad for you. So you don't have to worry about that. We do min-max, we do one-to-one -one buyback. We've got a couple of different reordering methods for you that are uh, popular as far as replenishing your stock and making sure that you don't run out of fast-moving parts. Uh, the other thing that we do is a great job of physical inventory. When it's time for inventory to take inventory, uh, we create count sheets for you. Those count sheets can be traditional style count sheets if you want to just take a physical inventory um, and print count sheets for people to count the parts. You can do it this way. Um, there's a grid into which you can post your count. And we can also remember I was showing you that scanner. You can use the scanner and these counts will dump right into the count sheet here so that you don't have to manually go into the grid and, and enter the counts. The counts actually are imported from the scan tool that we're using when we use that scanner, that Honeywell scanner that we were showing you. Um, just to kind of round this out, when you finish taking inventory, we do something called a plus and minus adjustments report. And this is going to give you an idea of how accurate your inventory was. You take a physical inventory, and let's say, for example, we had a $122 item. We thought there were seven. We counted there were only six. It's a negative one adjustment. So 122 is our loss on that line item or shrinkage as it drops from 859 down to 737. So it gives you an idea of how accurate your inventory was by line item, and then gives you your totals at the bottom when it's done. And this is called a plus and minus adjustments report. So you can uh, keep track of how accurate your inventory was at physical inventory time. So that's uh, also built into the system. A lot of these things we don't cover uh, in the demos, but I wanted to cover it today for you guys. And that scanner, Steve, am I, uh, how many SKUs can you actually uh, scan before you have to update or will it dock? So, so that's a great question. I, I, I think more than you have in your store. Um, we've tested it on, I don't know, thousands and thousands because it wasn't a documented question. So we've had somebody scan in 10,000 items and, and you know, it, it still collects it. It just collects it to a file. 
And then so they- then if, if you keep scanning, let's say 100 SKUs at all at one time, what after, are you able to adjust after you scan? Are you able to adjust your inventory right there and then? You can adjust it in the grid, right? So when you bring, here's what happens. You bring the, the, the scan tool or the gun back and you import the file. So there's an import okay. scan feature and it'll grab the file from, from the gun and it'll, it'll import it. And then you'll see your counts that basically go into the actual grid like this. So you can see what the counts are. And if for some reason you have to adjust the counts, you can do it at that point. Oh, okay. Because you can't really see the counts when they're on the gun. You know what I mean? You're not really seeing the yeah. count. You only see it when it's physically represented on the screen, like I'm showing you here. Okay. After, okay. After. So, then, so you physically count your, I mean, you, of course, you have to physically count the item. And then you got to have your, like, let's just say your count sheet. And then you scan, you count your item, and you write your number down on your, on your, no. on your sheet. No, you don't do it one at a time. You take the scan tool and you just go walking around the store and you scan three of these, two of these, five of these, whatever. And as soon as you're done doing all the scanning at once, you bring it back to the computer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not one item at a time. If you wanted to do it one at a t one item at a time, you do it in the item screen. You scan in an item like I did here. You enter your mm -hmm. count and then you save it. And then you're doing it one item at a time in the item screen. And then you're seeing a physical representation as you go. So you can do it. You can really do it both ways, arguably. Okay. All right. So here we go at the end here. We've talked about pricing. Um, these system options are additional options for you guys. If you want to buy any of these additional hardware options, they're not included in the software price, uh, which brings us to the installation options that we have for Commander. Now with Commander, the software is typically delivered through download. And so as soon as you place your order, we send you an email that has the links in it that you can just download and then we connect in and we install it for you. Um, the installation is included in the price. You don't have to worry about that. We're going to do the install for you. And so don't worry about having to hire an IT person or whatever. It's all included in the cost. Uh, then we're going to have a training class for you folks, and that happens every Wednesday. You'll be able to attend a training class. This is going to take care of getting, uh, we call this for new dealers and new hires. So anytime you hire a new person and they need training, uh, we're able to get you trained this way. Uh, then you can also schedule what's called one-on-one -on -one training after that, where you get individual training after you've taken the, the group training. Um, our tickets, uh, our, sorry, our technical support is phone, email, and ticket support. So when you call in, we've got a support department that takes care of you. Our support hours are Monday through Saturday. Uh, tech support is not open on Sundays. Uh, but other than that, uh, we've got a great tech support department and uh, really a lot of guys there and gals there that really do know their stuff and have been working with the software for a long time. We have a video training library on our website that also is available for you to watch uh, training videos if you just want to catch uh, or get an answer to one particular subject, how to do an invoice, how to add a customer, whatever. Those are all on the, uh, on the website now so that you have a way to get an answer to a question uh, if you just want to do a little self-study or self-educating uh, that's available also. And that kind of brings us, brings us to the end. So I appreciate you guys uh, sitting through this demo, and I'll uh, I'll be back around to chat with you individually about what you need and don't need, and your uh, start times, and uh, you know we can chat separately outside of this meeting. I think I'll give you both a call after the meeting here and just pick up any additional thoughts. Do you want to? Are there any additional questions before we wrap up? You know we are we're a small engine, but one thing that we do do is we have a fleet of basically 80 trucks for one company that we maintain. Oh, yeah. We will still be able to enter all this in there, correct? That would be great. Yeah, remember when I showed you the customer and I called it their toy box? Yes. You would literally click on that one customer's name and you would see the entire fleet listed and then pick the one that you were servicing. And you'd have service history on every single one of them. Okay. Then one last question for you. In your your brands list that we were looking at where it showed different products yes sir not everything that we do is not there like for example i didn't see owning i didn't see uh whacker okay are, 
I'm assuming that those are available or, or yes, we should we're go well, first of all, not every price file that we have available is on that list because there's too many of them. I didn't think so. That's Sec what I figured. That just Se secondly, let me just mention this because that's a great that was a great question, and I do want to show you this. Is the the price file loader is designed in a way that uh, can load two types of price files. And so we have what we call standard files, and then we we have what we call custom files. So there's standard and custom. There's two tabs. And the idea behind this design is that all of the standard files are the ones that we host on our server here. And uh, we update, and then you just grab those files from it. The custom files are in case we run into a situation where there's a price file and we don't have it. Then all we do is we con we contact the rep and we say, okay, we need an, you know, an ONAN file. I think we have the ONAN file, but let's say we didn't. We would simply contact your rep and say, okay, send us the ONAN file, and then we have a way to format it and load it um, using this custom tab where we don't necessarily have to host it for you, but we could just format it in Excel or in a spreadsheet a certain way, and then it loads right into Commander this way. So you almost have a vehicle whereby you can load your own price files if you chose to, because in outdoor power equipment especially, um, a lot of those pri a lot of that pricing is custom pricing or contract pricing with the companies that you deal with. So the, the pricing can vary. Um, so it's really great to have a way to load the files that are really pertinent for your pricing and specific to your particular shop, not somebody else's shop. Okay. And so in, in the list that you send us, you'll notice on the right-hand side in the bottom right of page two of your price quote, there's a place for you to put in the additional files that you need. And so any additional files that you need, um, you can certainly just write down any that you don't see listed that you might want to have added. Uh, please feel free to go ahead and list those and uh, we'll make sure that you, we'll make sure that we, that we get those loaded for you. I do have a question on when you do the price updates and they have price changes, mm -hmm. is there a report that comes out letting you know which items had price changes? Only if the items had been labeled. And so. is that if items had been labeled from your label maker yes. or? Yes, if you had printed labels in Commander and there was a price change, we give you a list of everything that needs to be relabeled. That was the idea behind that feature. I don't think it's a bad idea to have something that said, well, here's price changes, but um, it would be, be, be quite a, it would be an interesting report. Look, you can inventory things. One of the things you can do, Vanessa, is you can run a list very easily in Commander and you can have that. All of our reports just archive out. So if you are running a report of your inventory, um, mostly people want to keep up with super sessions. That's a big question with Mercury and some of these other companies. And that's where we, uh, we have a way to give you a, a list of all the items that have been superseded so you can move the inventory to the current number if you need to. Right. Okay. But, but fortunately, we introduced that feature that I showed you with the forward and backward super session search. And that's been a great, that's a great feature for you because it doesn't matter if you type in the old number or the new number, you're still going to be able to see that you have the item. Which is very nice. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. All right, guys. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. And I'll be talking to uh, both of you real soon. Thank All you. right. Great. All right, guys. Okay. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, <laughs>